Okay, well, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to midweek tonight. I hope you feel amply welcomed. I know there's been several people up here to welcome you. Uh, my name is Trey Newman. Uh, I'm the Campus Fellowship Director at Drake. There we go. Okay, there we go. That's a, that's a little shout out to Fall Conference last year. At Fall Conference, we as a Drake crew worked on the dog Bark and... Uh, we probably don't have it down quite as much as some of the other schools, but we're, we're working on it. <laughs> nice word, Bulldogs. But yeah, I'm the campus fellowship director at Drake. I'm very excited to be, uh, to be teaching tonight, to be kicking off our series that we're going to go through the, the rest of this semester in the book of Ephesians. Um, just a little bit about me. I graduated from Drake in uh, 2021, so about a little over three years ago now, uh, with a degree in actuarial science. Uh, but then I decided to go on staff here at the church, with Walnut Creek Church. So quite a pivot from what my plan was. Um, but the last three and a half years have been probably the best three and a half years of my life. Um, and I'm really, really thankful. That's how it's played out. I'm also married. Um, usually my wife, Allie, would be here. You'd probably see her sitting in the back. Um, unfortunately, she was not able to make it tonight. Um, some of you in the Drake crew are nodding at that and smiling. That's because uh, on Monday, three days ago, we had our first baby. So, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. On Monday we had our we had our daughter. My my daughter was born at 1:17 a.m. and uh, her name's Raylan Joy Newman. Um, I think we have a photo. Uh, do we got it? Yeah, yeah. So there's my family. There's uh, yeah. That's crazy. Okay, there's my, there's my family. That's me, my wife, and my daughter. Um, yeah, pretty wild. Uh, but tonight, we are uh, kicking off our semester-long series here, uh, where we're going to spend our time at our midweek services, the whole semester, studying through the book of Ephesians. Um, just for a little bit of context, before we dive into Ephesians, uh, Ephesians is a book in the New Testament, meaning it was written um, after Jesus, after Jesus came. Uh, it was written by the Apostle Paul. Um, who, if you're not familiar with his story, he had a pretty radical conversion to Christianity. He actually went from someone who was rounding up and killing Christians to someone who probably became, I would say, the most effective um, missionary for the advancement of Christianity probably ever in the world. So he, he pretty radical story. But he wrote the book of Ephesians uh, about 30 years after Jesus died and resurrected. So he wrote, Jesus, wrote Ephesians and his goal with the book was to write a book to um, primarily to Gentile Christians, so meaning non-Jewish Christians or, or brand new Christians who were unfamiliar with the rest of the scriptures. And he wrote it to them, and it's kind of a two-part book. The first half, he's talking about like deep theological truth of salvation, talking about what it means to be saved, what, what you're saved from, what it means to become a Christian. And then the second half of the book, he turns and he starts talking about some pretty practical Christian living. And so you'll probably notice that over the course of the semester, that we'll start to have a shift about midway through to some more practical uh, instructions. But I'm really excited to go through this book. So this book uh, is an awesome book for several reasons, but one, I think this book is incredibly helpful for new or young Christians. My freshman year of college, about eight years ago at Drake, uh, it was a pretty radical change in my own life, and this book was one of the first books, maybe the first book that I read in the Bible, and the Lord used it in some pretty powerful ways to change me, and I think, uh, Lord willing, it, it will do the same for, for many of you. So I'm really excited for Ephesians, and tonight, specifically, we're going through just the beginning, the very beginning, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In this section, Paul spells out uh, what I would call the blessings or benefits, you know, what's to gain um, for the Christian. And I think as I've been thinking about this all week, as I've been studying the passage, um, I've just been thinking about that, that really every decision we make in our life is based on what we perceive the benefits of that decision to be. So anything we do, we, we think about or we decide, we think about, hmm, how would this benefit me? How would this affect me, or maybe how would this benefit the people around me, or whatever you value, you'd think about what you value, you'd think about how this decision will affect that, and then you make a decision based on that. And just to further this point, I've been thinking today, I've got a few, uh, I've got a few would-you-rather questions, okay? 
and, and, the, and the point is, hopefully that'll further my point here, but a few would you rather questions, and I'm going to need some audience participation, okay? Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pose the question, and then I'll reiterate the answers. I'm going to have people raise their hand, one or the other answer, okay? That's what we're doing. Does that make sense? Okay, first question is this. I got this one from our typical announcements guy, Brian, and it's this. Would you rather be a garbage man or woman for the rest of your working life? So until, we'll say, 62, okay? You're going to retire at 62. Would you rather be a garbage man or woman the rest of your working life, but you make 150000 a year, okay? So that's your choice one. Garbage man or woman, that's your job. You don't have any other job. Garbage route, 150 k a year. Or would you rather have your dream job, any job in the world, whatever job you want, 50 k a year, okay? 50K a year. You get to do whatever you want, 50K a year. Okay, so two options, garbage man, 150, dream job, 50. Okay, let's get, let's get a hand. Okay, raise your hand with me. Maybe not with me. If you would rather be a garbage man for 150K. Let's see it. Hands raised. We've got some garbage men, some garbage, not a lot, some garbage women in this zone here. Okay, okay. Okay, how, okay, now put your hands down. Raise your hand with me if you'd rather be a dream job, have your dream job 50K a year. Okay, okay. Wow, a lot of, lot of dream jobs. <laughs> okay. And what that shows is there, obviously, there's different underlying motives. There's different underlying motives in what people want to do. Okay, another hypothetical. Second one. Would you rather marry the guy or girl of your dreams? Okay, the guy or girl of your dreams and have the most blissful marriage the rest of your life, but you live in a shack in Antarctica, okay? <laughs> and we'll say it has minimal heating. It heats you enough, but not well, okay? So that's option one, Antarctica, person of your dreams. Option two, would, or would you rather never get married? You're gonna be solo for life, okay, riding solo, but you get to live anywhere in the world, in any house in the world, anywhere you want, rest of your life, okay? Option one, let's see, let, okay, guy or girl of your dreams, Antarctica, option two, wherever you want. Okay, raise your hand for option one, guy or girl of your dreams, Antarctica. Okay, a lot of the room. We got some people that want to brave the cold. Carson, you get your hand up, you get your hand up right now. <laughs> Thank you, Carson. Okay, now let's see, uh, let's see, uh, never married, but wherever you want to live in the whole world. Okay, okay. So again, it shows... It shows what you value, what you perceive your value to be. Okay, third would you rather. Third and final would you rather. Okay, and I want you to think long and hard on how you answer this third would you rather, okay? Would you rather see another picture of my beautiful three-day-old <laughs> baby girl up on the screen, or would you rather see a picture of dog poop? Okay, those are your two options. Okay, weigh the options. Again, think long and hard before you <laughs> answer this one. Okay, let's get hands raised if you'd rather see a daughter or a picture of Raylan Joy, my little baby girl. Okay, I'm seeing some of you. Peyton, you get your hand up. <laughs> okay, now raise, what's with the DMAC crew with their hands down? <laughs> okay, let's see, raise your hand if you'd rather see a picture of dog poop. Okay, all of you that raise your hand, you can exit the, you can exit the, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, since, since Raylan won, let's get a picture of her up. Let's get a picture. No, Evan. No, no, no. What are we... Okay, there's my daughter. There's my daughter. Okay, again, what you see is what people value. The decisions you make in your life, one way or another, is going to be based on what you perceive to add value to your life. And so like I said, the passage tonight, what it talks about is the benefits of becoming a Christian. In a sense, the passage tonight will hopefully help you make the decision of would you rather be a Christian or would you rather choose what the world has to offer? Okay, that's, that's what the passage tonight is dealing with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the passage, Ephesians 1, 1 through 14. Um, then I'm going to pray and I'm going to dive in just as a precursor, I will spend the overwhelming majority of my time tonight in verses 7 through 14, okay? But I'm going to read the whole thing just so we get the whole passage in. So open up with me if you have your Bible. Um, 
If you don't, that's okay. It'll be on the screen to Ephesians 1, 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time, to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. In him we have also received an inheritance, because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will, so that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. In him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. All right, let's pray. Lord God, uh, thank you for tonight. Thank you for um, your word. Thank you for how good you are to us, that you delight in bringing people to yourself, that you delight in saving people, that you delight in adopting people as your sons and daughters through the blood of your son. Lord, we love you, and I pray that you just give me words to say. Let the truth of the scripture sink in tonight um, to all in here and all who need to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to look at is the three benefits or the three blessings of the Christian offer, okay? This is what you gain, according to Paul in Ephesians 1, from becoming a Christian. The three that we're going to look at are redemption and inheritance and the Spirit, Redemption and inheritance and the Spirit. First, if you become a Christian, you receive redemption. Redemption. I'm going to read verses 7 to 10 again. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ, as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. This blessing, the blessing of redemption, is the most central and primary blessing of becoming a Christian. As a Christian, what you receive is redemption, or in here it reiterates, it explains it also as forgiveness for your sins through the blood of Jesus. Now, you might be wondering to yourself, well, what does that mean, <laughs> right? I, I receive redemption for my sins through the blood of Jesus, but how does that work? Well, in your life, you have chosen in your life to actively rebel against God. Whether that comes in the form of sexual sin, in pornography or fornication, whether it comes in the form of hatred of other people, whether it's gossip or judgmentalism, whether that, whether that comes in maybe a more subtle way in pride and uh, maybe misplaced confidence before God. Whatever it is, you have chosen to rebel against God and you actually know it. Now, what do I mean by you know it? Well, I've probably shared this hypothetical probably every year that I've been on staff, but I, I think it, it proves this point well. Um, and it's this hypothetical. So imagine that someone could make a movie about your life. And they're making this movie about your life, but then they find some way to record not only every action that you do, but every internal thought that you have. So they're recording every single thing you've ever done, hitting on everything. They get every impure thought you've ever had about someone, every time you've ever in your mind thought poorly of someone, every time you know, you've done that thing that nobody knows about, that you're maybe trying not even to think about right now that you've done, everything is recorded and made into a, just a nice... Uh, movie and it's playing this Saturday night on the big screen. The question is, how many people are you going to invite to that movie? 
and I just say, if you're anything like me, the answer is probably zero. <laughs> and in fact, for me, I'm probably doing every single thing that I possibly can to destroy the movie. Like, I just, I'm saying, no way, I don't want anyone to see that. Because we know inside of us that we have chosen to rebel against God, that we have sinned, that we have done wrong. And even people who, like, it's so interesting. I, I've had a lot of conversations with people over the years on, on this point, and even people who bring up the idea of morality, and they're like, no, there's, there's no objective morality. It's, you you kind of decide for yourself what's right and wrong. There's a lot of people who would land there. I bet there's probably some in this room who would think that. Even those people, if you then ask them, okay, you set your own right and wrong. Have you ever broken your own morality? Everyone's like, well, yeah, I have. Everybody knows that we've sinned against God. And it's in the midst of that that this first blessing, the blessing of redemption, becomes so sweet, almost, I would say almost overwhelming to us. So from the very beginning, back in Genesis 3, we talked about this with the Drake crew a little bit last week, but from the very beginning, God made very clear what sin deserves or what sin receives. Our rebellion against God, what it gets, and that is death. Now, he made that clear in a couple ways. He, right after they sinned in the garden in Genesis 3, it breaks their relationship with God. They hide from him, but then he makes it very clear right away that they are now no longer going to live forever. Meaning what? That they're going to die. Now, up until that point, nothing has died yet. But he says, nope, now they're going to die. And then what God does is he actually kills some animals to cover Adam and Eve. They're, after they sin, they're ashamed of their nakedness, and God covers them with animals. But those animals that died to cover Adam and Eve, it was, it was the first death. Up until that point in creation, death didn't exist. Now, why did death exist? Well, it was because of sin. See, in God's mind, and this is crystal, crystal clear throughout the scriptures, sin and death are so closely related that they're, they're almost one and the same. Sin leads to death, and death is because of sin. Paul clarifies this point as well. Paul, who wrote Ephesians in Romans 6, 23 at the beginning, it just says the wages of sin is death making it crystal clear. That's what sin deserves. Now, what is that death? Well, that death, more specifically, is separation from God, like Adam and Eve, who hid from God in the garden, but it's separation from God for all eternity in hell. Sin leads to death. And for the Christian, for the one who becomes a Christian, this is actually no different. Your sin, as a Christian, leads to death. But for the Christian, it's just not your death. Jesus died on the cross so that his blood would cover over your sin. That's what it means. In him, we have redemption through his blood. See, in Christ, he redeemed us. He paid for our sin using his own perfect, spotless blood. This is why the gospel is the sweetest thing ever in the world. I mean, think about it. God sent his son to die on the cross so that your sin, that thing that you don't want anyone to know about, so that your sin would be paid for by his perfect son on the cross. I'm just gonna say it. I've been a dad for three days and I'm not sending my daughter to die. Like it's just, it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. But God sent his son to die on the cross to pay for your sin with his own blood. In him, we have redemption. Now question, what does the world offer as a counter offer. Okay, so the Christian life, becoming a Christian offers you redemption. But what does the world offer? Well, the world offers the ability to call yourself a good person. The world offers the ability to call yourself a good person. So I want you to make no mistake, accepting this first part of the Christian the Christian message, the Christian offer. It actually does come at great cost to you. It comes at the cost of your reputation. To accept the redemption that Christ offers, you must first accept the fact that you need to be redeemed. If you don't need to be redeemed, then you don't need redemption. Does that make sense? To, to accept the redemption of the cross, you have to be willing to admit that your sin was enough to need to be paid for by the cross. Do you see how that makes sense? You will not accept the redemption if you think, you know what, I... My sin, not so bad. I'm a pretty good person. But that's what the world offers you. It offers you the ability to call yourself 
a good person. So that's what you need to weigh in the first choice. And knowing that sometimes, you know, trying to think through what, what, am I, what do I actually believe, what do I actually think, sometimes that can be a little bit tricky. What I have for each of these three points is a diagnostic question, a question that I think hopefully will help you think through where you're at, whether or not you've accepted the offer for the Christian or whether or not you've accepted the offer of the world. And the diagnostic question for this one is this. What is your response when you sin? Do you hide your sin or try to atone for it yourself or do you expose your sin and humbly bring it before God and others? So when someone who has not yet accepted the Christian offer of redemption sins, there's someone who still wants to be able to say that they are a good person. When someone like that sins, they must maintain their good image or their reputation in some way. And I think there's probably two ways, mainly I've seen people try to do this, probably two ways I've tried to do it in my own life. Uh, One way is you try to hide it. You just try to stuff it down. You don't want anyone to see it. You don't even want to think about it yourself. It didn't happen, so you hide it. Or another way is you try to atone for it. You're like, okay, I I know I messed up, but I'm going to do enough good things now to outweigh it. For the next week, I'm going to be really good. But either way, whether you hide it, whether you try to atone for it, you're not accepting the redemption that is offered in Christ. But those who have accepted the offer of redemption in Christ, they have freedom and security in Jesus, that you are forgiven of your sin. You have been washed clean by his blood of your sin. And so what you do when you sin is radically different. You sin, but when you do, you expose it before God and before people, knowing confidently that there is forgiveness offered to you in Christ. There's a security in Christ. So first, the Christian receives redemption. Second, the Christian receives an inheritance. It says in verses 11 and 12, In him we have also received an inheritance, because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will, so that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. So the second blessing and benefit of becoming a Christian is that you receive an inheritance from God. Now, baked into that truth is, uh, I would say, one of the most glorious truths in the whole Bible that I'm not even going to have any time to talk about tonight, but I feel that I would miss it if I didn't at least bring it up, is the truth that the nature of an inheritance, hopefully most of you know what an inheritance is, the nature of an inheritance is that you receive it from your parents or from your family. And so baked into this truth that you receive an inheritance is that you actually get adopted into God's family as his sons or daughters. If you become a Christian, you become a son or a daughter of God himself. But what is this inheritance then that you receive? Well, I don't have nearly enough time to dive into it. But high level, I'd say this inheritance is eternal glory in the presence of God when you die. Maybe you probably heard it as a kid, as you you go to heaven. You go to heaven, or you're going to be resurrected in the new earth. You get to be with God in eternal glory for all of time, making death the most appealing thing in the world. And this is why Paul in Philippians 1 could write this, For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul confidently knew that he had already received this inheritance. He knew that if I die, I'm going to be with the Lord. And so the second piece of the Christian is you receive an inheritance. And what this means is that you're not only unafraid of death, but you're actually excited for it. Um, now, what will that actually look like one day in heaven? I don't even really know. I, you know I, I'm not even going to really try to take a stab at it, but just a couple things that I think it will definitely include is, one, God himself, the giver of every good gift, the God who is abounding in faithful love and truth, he will be there always in a far more glorious way than he is here, even though it's incredibly glorious here. (laughs) We will be amazed with ever-increasing joy at who God is in heaven. And second, there will be no sin. There will be no sin at all. And I just want you to imagine a community. Imagine being in your campus group, or imagine finding a group of friends, or imagine a family, just a community where there is zero sin where everyone in the group is completely loving everybody else sacrificially all the time. Everyone in the group is like Jesus, is 100% of the time just caring for people, loving people, never saying a poor word about someone, always encouraging, always teaching, always helping. 
And everyone is also doing exactly what they were designed and created to do. They're all fitting exactly into the role that the Lord has them in. Well, I think heaven is going to be much better than that. (laughs) But I think that would be pretty sweet. (laughs) Now, what is the world's counteroffer here? So Christ offers you an inheritance in the next life. Well, the world's counteroffer is this, an inheritance during this life. The promise the world makes is this. If you live for me here now, I will give you some comfort, satisfaction, and happiness. And I would say this is is partially true. You know, if you give all of your life, all of your time, all of your energy, all of your resources to, you know, working hard to get a really good degree, and then you find the best job, and you just work super hard, and you make a ton of money, and you have a huge house, and a big family, and whatever else you are dreaming about, there is a chance that you will find that or get it. And I would even say probably in it, you'll find some degree of happiness. But I will say, I think it will be a sad day when that person who lived for this life, who's built up their inheritance in this life, when that person dies and decays in the ground the exact same way as the person who had nothing on the street corner. And they realize what they've lost for all of eternity. Christ offers a heavenly inheritance. Now, diagnostic question here. What are your time, money, and resources primarily going towards? Are they things that will benefit you in this life or the next? Just think about it. Are you living this life only focused on just getting, you know, the excellent, say, pharmacy degree so that you can make a ton of money as a pharmacist one day and then you can make a lot of money and retire young and you know, go live in Florida or wherever you want to live. Or are you maybe not thinking so much about the future, but you're living right now, chasing an inheritance, chasing comfort today. You know, maybe it's in the form of just running after the next emotional high, whether it's going to parties or maybe it's through sports or relationships or whatever it might be. Are you living to build up an inheritance here now or one day in eternity? And finally, third, the third aspect of, or the third benefit that Paul brings up in Ephesians 1 of becoming Christian is the Spirit. It says in verses 13 and 14, In him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. I, I feel like I probably could preach probably 10 sermons on these two verses here and not even scratch the surface on explaining the significance of the Holy Spirit and what we receive in the Spirit. Um, but I think just something to focus on in these two verses is this. The Holy Spirit, which you receive when you believe, simply when you believe the gospel. If you're not a Christian right now and say you became a Christian tonight, you would receive the Spirit of God inside of you tonight. That's a real thing that would happen to you. The Spirit of God that you receive when you believe is the down payment of your inheritance. It guarantees your inheritance. And what this means is that, in a sense, you receive some of that inheritance right now. Some of that future glory, that future joy, that future awe at who God is, you receive some of it through the Spirit now, today. Now, again, I, th- I think this is what starts to get at why Christian community is so amazing. You know, when you live in community with other believers who are filled with the Spirit, you start to get a taste of what it one day will look like to be in heaven for all eternity in, with no sin. But it also, um, reflecting on the fact that, that in heaven there will be no sin, what the Spirit does in you now is the Spirit starts to change you. The Spirit starts to flip your life upside down, that you go from someone who's pursuing sin, who's pursuing whatever you want to pursuing the Lord. And I'm excited for you guys to continue coming to midweeks and hearing testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony of people who this has happened to. People who lived for their sin, who lived chasing the next high or the next pleasure or whatever, who became a Christian, and their life flipped radically. And that's what happened to me. It's what happened to Walker. It's what happened to every person who's going to share their testimony every week and midweek. Now, what is the counteroffer? What does the world offer you? Instead of the spirit, the world's counteroffer is autonomy and independence. 
autonomy and independence. So just a warning to you. If you believe the gospel and you receive the spirit of God inside of you, then you no longer get to, or I would, I would say have to, you no longer have to have control over your own life. See, the very nature of having the spirit inside of you is that the spirit now lives through you. The spirit is guiding your decisions, your steps, your whole life. And I acknowledge in that there is a great mystery as to how that works, you know, also with our own conscience, our own decision-making, our own free will. There's a mystery there, but the premise is still true. The Spirit is the one who guides your life. You must give up control. And I would say this is a direct contradiction to what the world says you should do. The world tells you to live your own life, to pursue your own path, to do what you want. Well, my... <laughs> While my wife was in labor the other day, I was watching the Vikings game, okay? Uh, it was early labor. It was early labor, and it was actually helpful. She was watching, too. We were just watching the Vikes. The Vikes did well. I've got my Viking socks on tonight, you know. Go Vikes. Okay, we're, we're going to beat the Niners this Sunday, okay? No doubt about it. And Sam Darnold, we trust. But, <laughs> but I was watching the game, and this commercial came on. It was an American Eagle commercial. Trevor Lawrence was in it. And I actually like Trevor Lawrence, but... I didn't like the commercial, but the, the commercial, it was this. It was just different athletes and celebrities repeating this line over and over and over again. That was the whole commercial, and it was just this. Live your life, 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 live your life. But make no mistake, accepting the Christian message and accepting the spirit means that you no longer get to live your life. It means you live his life. Or even maybe better put, he lives your life. You no longer belong to yourself. You belong to God. And so, diagnostic question here. Now, this one I wrestled through. What, what, what in a sense, is the opposite of uh, de- the Spirit? What is the opposite of depending on God? And, and it's this. Do you cry for God? Do you cry for God? Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I think the opposite of autonomy and independence is dependence. <laughs> it would be to be dependent upon God. And I was, again, just reflecting on this idea of being dependent on someone all week. And obviously where my mind went was to, again, to my three-day-old baby girl. And, okay, I don't know the first thing about being a dad. (laughs) I got no clue what I'm doing. But one thing that I have learned is that she cries a lot. Okay? She cries a lot. She cries when she's hungry. She cries when she's cold. She cries when she needs to poop. She cries when she needs to fart. She cries when... She's tired, she cries when she's being changed. She, I mean, she cries, like, all the time. She cries a lot. And I was just thinking about it. Who is she crying to? Well, she's crying to, to me and Allie, her parents. She is completely dependent on me and Allie to live. If we do not care for her, she will die. She's fully dependent on us. And just like Raylan cries to us for everything... So the Christian, the one who has become a Christian, has received the Spirit, cries out to his or her Father in heaven to fill us with his Spirit, to guide our steps. The Christian understands that apart from the Spirit of God, separated from him, we can do nothing. And so we cry out to him. And I think this can take a lot of different forms. This could look like prayer. This could look like time in God's word. This could look like time with fellow believers. This could look like sitting under sound teaching of the scriptures and a lot of more things, okay? But the Christian cries out to God. And so when I explain that, this idea of just being dependent upon God, like a baby is dependent on her parents, is that you? You know, is that you? Do you feel that I'm describing you? Do you, in your soul, need God desperately Or are you content on your own? So just as a recap, the three blessings of the Christian offer, what you get for becoming a Christian, redemption and inheritance and the spirit. And I only have one application tonight, and the application is this, that you should accept the offer. You should accept the offer. If you are not a Christian, um, I, I think I've just become more and more convinced of this. If we could just see everything clearly, if we could just see eternity, if we could just see what the inheritance looks like, 
if we could just see the glory of the Spirit, if we could just see how amazing redemption is, if we could see it all, I think that the decision to become a Christian would be an absolute no-brainer. I think an even easier no-brainer than the decision to look at a picture of my daughter versus the picture of dog poop, even though some of you had the wrong answer to that one. Okay, It would be an absolute no-brainer. So my encouragement to you is accept the offer. And, and even to encourage you further on that, if you haven't accepted that offer, you could accept it like tonight. Like, there is no need to delay. And so accept the offer. Accept what Christ offers you. Accept his redemption. Accept the inheritance. Accept the spirit of God. He's, he's, so, much, he's so much better. Uh, let's pray. Lord God, uh, thank you for tonight. Um, God, I pray for those in this room. Um, God, I pray for those who don't know you, that, God, you would convince them that you are worth their life, that you are worth them repenting of their sins, exposing their wickedness. You are worth them living for you and pursuing um, treasure in heaven. You are worth them depending on you like a little baby. God, you are worth everything and much more than that. God, I pray for those who have not accepted that, that they would. And God, I pray for those in here who have accepted that, that they would, um, God, run after you with an even greater fervor, an even greater love, an even greater desire, that they would pursue you radically with their whole heart. Lord, we love you, we praise you, praise things in Jesus' name.